Hello everybody, and thank you for giving the EF Show a click. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Today we'll be discussing this year's Outlook 2019-2020 winter and some of the best destinations for skiing and sledding in the U.S. So looking at the recent climate report, we're looking at some above average temperatures and you've seen this all over the world. You've seen it in Europe with the record summers, you've seen it here in America with uh, the crazy lows and highs and many uh, a mis- many uh, people think that uh, you know the cold doesn't mean global warming, but that's a misconception. Uh, Actually, this cold is brought about by uh, global warming because it means more precipitation, which means that the weathers on the opposite sides are more harsh. So hotter summers and colder winters, higher precipitation or lower precipitation based on where you live. So looking around the whole country, um, temperatures will be above average. Um, We're looking and almost the entire country other than parts of iowa nebraska the dakotas minnesota wisconsin michigan indiana ohio montana and uh looks like part of colorado um are unaffected but everywhere else is going to be way above average and this is from the national weather service in NOAA. um their current outlook on it and even looking up into alaska the further north you get into alaska actually it's getting warmer so i thought that was crazy about um alaska but looking at hawaii you know these islands and they're in the middle of nowhere in the pacific ocean they are the highest that they have been and you know that's not even part of the continental u.s so we're looking at a global scale epidemic here of warmth and above average temperatures and it doesn't get better with the precipitation um so looking uh, at the climate report the uh, greatest likelihood for warmer than normal conditions are in alaska and hawaii with more modest probabilities for above average temperatures spanning large amounts of the remaining lower 48 from the west across the south and up the eastern seaboard a quote from noaa and uh, concluding that uh, with no part of the U.S. is favored to have below average temperatures this winter. So we're looking at no below average temperatures. None. We are looking at all above average. So that could mean more snow, more precipitation, or that could just mean that we are in a disaster where our weather systems are all out of whack. We could have tornadoes at Christmas time this year. Flashback to last year and the year before, we had those tornadoes in the south. We had the Dixie Alley tornadoes. There was a Dixie Alley outbreak, I believe, in uh, 2017. And all of these storms uh, were produced because of a, a dry line that managed to produce in the middle of December into January. And normally we're looking uh, at some places, I mean, excluding the Great Plains in the north where, you know, you have the freezing temperatures starting in August. But everywhere else where you have these average 50s now in the middle of November as the high, maybe 40 also, so 40 to 50. Now you have these highs in the teens. I mean, in a lot of places, they're breaking records for the lowest high. So that's the coldest the high has ever been. And I mean, the lows are just shattering records. I mean, the temperature drop and everything go from day to day. I recorded the other day a 50 degree drop over a few hour period. And that 50 degree drop actually put us 50 degrees below average. And thinking about that, 50 degrees below average is something that you rarely see, let alone at this time of year. You'll see cold in the late January, early February, when you're right in the thick of winter. But now, I mean, we're in the middle of November. I mean, it should be a little bit warmer and then sometimes getting cold. But the snow amounts are crazy. You look over the whole country and uh, saw something the other day that said that 30% of the country was covered in snow. And this snow isn't the light stuff. We're talking anywhere from one to eight inches. Some places gets up to a foot. And uh, most places getting two to three. So looking at all of this, I mean, it's an exact indicator of this climate change and how we need to start stepping on the pedal to get this thing going, get working on it. And considering that no part of the U.S. is favorable to have below average temperatures, I mean, winter has a hope, but it doesn't have a hope anymore. I mean, that the winter you think of isn't going to be the same anymore unless we start changing things now. 
which is why they're saying 2020 is a race to save the planet. I mean, it is. It doesn't involve politics at all. It is fully on the people's will to save the planet. I mean, we are the ones that have destroyed what we've been given. Now it's time to fix that. And so back, I mean, it's just crazy. So back to the uh, climate report, uh, the NOAA also predicts uh, that precipitation will be above average across the country. So, I mean, as I said, the whole warming of everything and how climate change is uh, occurring currently that is producing more precipitation. And where there isn't more precipitation, there are these droughts. And it's crazy to think in the middle of winter, whenever you should have tons of snow, that droughts and warmth is something that we could be considering. I remember about uh, four years ago, there was a uh, Christmas that I was able to wear shorts on, and it was 58 degrees. And that's at Christmas. And normally, that, that's a record high. But now we're seeing these more polar uh, temperatures. You're looking at ones that in some places are 101 and then you look further north, and a great example is the 101 it was in Miami. And then you look in the northern Florida where it was 31, and uh, that just doesn't happen. 31 in Florida. 50 is cold for them, so 31, I mean, they got snow in Georgia and everything. Places that, even if it does snow in the U.S., should not be getting snow now, especially in fall. I mean, it's crazy. And uh, looking at Alaska, uh, they are expecting wetter, wetter than average conditions, most likely in Alaska and Hawaii this winter, along with portions of the Northern Plains, Upper Mississippi Valley, the Great Lakes, and parts of the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast, also from NOAA. Uh, then they expect drier than average conditions, uh, most likely for Louisiana, parts of the Southeast, as well as Northern and Central California. So as I said about the precipitation, where you don't have this above average precipitation, you are now having a drought. And now, since years, two or three years in the past, have changed how all the records are set, we're looking at most of the country actually is in about average uh, precipitation. But looking, let's just put it back a decade, we are breaking records every single day. So uh, let's compare, you can compare it year to year for an average, but if you look at a decade or a century millennia, which millennia wasn't recorded, but if you look at the century, you can see that there is a vast change. That's why the weather stripes, if you ever see, have seen them before, the precipitation, the uh, temperatures and everything, are so vital for everyone to be taking those who, are, who is interested in weather, is because you really get to see what is happening every single day. You get to see that the temperature is going up, it's going down, more precipitation, when patterns and trends are occurring, you know, warmer weather, more severe storms, more rain, colder weather, that means uh, less snow, uh, more drought and things in the Great Plains. So it's really, it's a scientific process. You look at the, it's experimental and it's fun. I mean, I've been doing it since July. Here we are in November and it's kind of cool to see, okay, where do we start out? Where are we looking at? I mean, the temperatures of uh, 50 degrees above, now we're 50 degrees below, and it's a really cool thing. So I highly suggest you could do it. it to do it, you can do it with pencils, crayons, online. I use uh, spreadsheets to do mine because it's easier to fill in the cell, um, the little text box with it. So, yeah. So back to the uh, drought and precipitation, uh, the remainder of the U.S. falls into a category of equal chances for below or near, uh, near below or above average precipitation. Basically, what that sentence means, they have no idea what it's going to be. They can predict that it's going to be somewhere near average. They don't know where it's going to be. And that's not because they don't know how to do it. We just don't have a technology for it yet. I mean, that's why, you know, the predictions for tornadoes and things, that's what everyone's trying to find out. That's where everyone's experimenting with these different technologies. And that's how technology actually is extremely important in meteorology is because you're looking for predictions and everything. That's why the goes and everything scans and they forecast. And you look at the Euro model, GFS, and all the other spaghetti plots for hurricanes. And they have all of these different ones is because no one truly knows where this is, where anything is going or what it's going to happen. We can just try our best with what we have currently. 
So looking in deeper into in individual regions, uh, we're looking first at the uh, eastern coast. So temperature is very likely above average as winter. Precipitation near above average amounts. Not too surprising there. I mean, it's the eastern coast. And I'm looking at New England has near normal precipitation and very likely above average temperatures. So New England, you think of it as freezing cold, tons of rain and everything. So the precipitation is not surprising. It's average. It's always crazy there. So the average Average is crazy anyways but the temperature is what's surprising you know you get these warmer temperatures so we're not looking at crazy amounts of snowfall we'll be looking this year at more rain <clears throat> the Great Lakes um, is actually gonna uh, be likely above average temperatures with very likely above average precip so the Great Lakes in the Midwest is where you start looking into this curve and this curve is kind of like a jet stream look to it and we're really seeing where the drought is being pulled up because of the drier air in the south, which should be moi moist air and have a bit more moisture down there. But actually, it's drawing more dry air as the moisture pushes north and where all these snow and rain events are going to be occurring. Uh, so the same thing for the Midwest. We're looking at likely above average temps and very likely above average precipitation. So let's dive down to the south, and uh, we are looking at likely below average precipitation and very likely above average temperatures. It's the south, so with more dry air, it's going to get hotter. And, it, I mean, you will get these cold events every once in a while, but when they happen, they'll be extreme. They won't happen as, they won't be on a gradient, it won't happen gradually, it will happen all at once. We are going to have one day where a good, great example is Florida. You will have the north part of Florida being 30, the south part of Florida being 100. A 70 degree difference over a matter of 200 miles. And looking at places like the Great Plains, we have normal, but normal to above average temperatures and normal to above average precipitation. So not too much out of the norm there. I mean, we're looking at the same stuff kind of as always, but you always see that normal dash above. And whenever you start seeing that as a trend on every single thing, that's where we can conclude that this is climate change causing A or B, and then apply it to A through Z, and then all of a sudden you have the entire alphabet, which is climate change. And we're uh, looking at the southeast now, so we're looking at areas, uh, kind of Georgia-ish area, um, normal to above average temps, and actually below average precipitation. And back to the precipitation picture that I was talking about, this um, precipitation outlook is showing that, that drought, well, that's going to be down there. That's going to be in that southeast uh, quadrant of the U.S. is going to be this um, drought. It, it's not extreme. It's a little bit. So we're looking at maybe an inch or two below average of uh, precipitation, rain, snow, any of that stuff. Um, most likely rain. So not too crazy. I wouldn't worry about it if it's normal to below average or barely below average. But whenever you add, you start seeing things like very likely, that's when you need to start taking it seriously because the outlook is predicting that and then it's being backed up by uh, supporting details. The Northwest um, is having uh, normal to above average temperatures and uh, kind of along with everyone else, just likely ab above average precipitation we're looking at places like seattle where uh you know it rains all the time snows all the time so it's kind of hard to change um some a record and change the averages whenever you've seen over uh the time that we started recording back in 1800s to date the amount of uh precipitation that changes temperatures that change when you have this radical um margin and outliers every single year so a lot of these places, I mean, the outlooks can be helpful, like the Midwest, uh, Great Lakes in the South, in those places. But you go to these extremes where it, it's not, that's not really helping you too much. I mean, it gives you a kind of a general idea. But most of this is generally for the rest of the country, where a big event is a big event. It's not a common event that happens every once in a while. It is a big event. So looking at uh, places in California, uh, so for the West Coast, likely below average precipitation and above average temperatures. Um, same thing with the drought, you know, below average precipitation, above average temps, not much to say there. So let's not forget about our friends up in Alaska. Um, very likely above average temperatures and likely above average precipitation. So I mentioned about the uh, temperature uh, outlook for this winter and how Alaska, actually the further north you get, the hotter it's getting. 
And that brings us to the part of the hole in the ozone layer. So this is where uh, CO2 is kept in and everything is a greenhouse effect. When this hole come is uh, kind of burnt out almost by the CO2, um, that's where this is at, is in the Arctic. And what happens is this that CO2 layer protects us. It's an atmosphere, uh, the ozone is. It's an atmosphere that protects us from solar rays, uh, gamma rays and stuff. <clears throat> and that's actually what raises temperatures. It's almost like sending fire through a tube and expecting the end of it to warm up. It'll get there eventually, and when it does, it's going to fry it. So that's what's slowly happening because Earth's atmosphere is very thick. That's what allows us to be able to have such nice bearable temperatures uh, for vegetation to grow, for uh, you know lava to be moving, for plate tectonics. It's basically what allows everything in life that we know of to stay alive is this uh, atmosphere because it creates a really when you look at comparison to where we are to the sun it allows us to have this atmosphere and the thicker it is at times the better it is or the worse that's something that we fight over with the atmosphere the thicker we make it are those hazy days and everything where you get the co2 and it can be bad and really hot but other days it's great because who wants the sun frying your planet um it's not too good if you're trying to make some more you don't want a burnt marshmallow so uh, really looking at that, that's a great example of why Alaska is so hot this year. We are, uh, I was making a podcast idea back in the summer that um, I will be talking about later on actually next year at the beginning of the summer um, because I wanted to make the topic and kind of strand it out because looking at this, you know, Alaska was warmer than many places in the U.S., like looking at the latitude and longitude that is that should not be possible should not happen where it is that much hotter looking today i mean looking today i'm recording this on the 19th the 13th of november um we had the same temperature in nashville as we did in the most northern outpost uh barrow of uh, alaska 17 degrees and that's for the cold part of it. But even looking, you know, there should be much colder temperatures in Alaska. Especially this time of year, whenever it's not even the same side. I mean, they have sun out for, what, maybe six hours? It's, I mean, you go to places like that where you have maybe an hour or two of daylight in the middle of winter. And it's like negative 30 or whatever. And that that's what you expect Alaska to be not the same as some places in Nashville and especially like you look further into the south and it's about the same as what it was in uh, I believe Amarillo Texas today had about 18 degrees so it's kind of an interesting topic to talk about is what's the difference between Alaska and the rest of us here in the lower 48 with uh, how the temperature works and what the climate is and everything and even though that's a territory looking at how far away it truly is it's 3,000 500 and some miles from Nashville and they're the exact same temperature and that 3,500 and some miles isn't to the left or right it's straight up so looking at that that temperature should drop by a ton and so uh it's it's crazy looking at Alaska and Hawaii Hawaii is humid now they used to have trade winds and everything they used to blow through and give them nice breezes and everything but I went there um at the end of the summer this year and it was amazing but whenever I went to Honolulu I stayed in Maui most of the time uh but whenever I went to Honolulu it was amazing how hot it was and humid it was sticky but while you're in Maui, depending on where you were at, it was nice, cool breeze, it was tropical, and it was really an experience to enjoy. It was a rich, it was the Hawaiian experience. And you go to other places where there's cities and stuff, and you look at the rest of Hawaii, and where it's, you know, some islands are blocked off, and it's thick, not enjoyable, it is just, it's brutal to live there. And... I mean, it, it's, it used to be this nice little nation and everything, and super nice uh, temperatures, but now we're starting to see that climate change is now attacking our uh, precious islands and everything, looking at Fiji and everything, crop failure, massive flooding. You're seeing this on a global scale, and it's not, affecting, it's not only affecting us humans, it's affecting all animals, all life, everything. It's affecting the footprint of things in the past, and it's something that we really have to consider. 
So we'll be right back after this break with some amazing uh, destinations for your travel, uh, and skiing and sledding this winter, and uh, some good notes on those, and some uh, good tips on the way. So we'll be right back. Okay, so welcome back. So as I mentioned before the break, uh, I'm going to tell you about some of the best destinations for winter sports across the country. So we're starting out, we're going to list five of them, starting from five all the way up to our number one uh, destination to visit. And most of these are generally about skiing. Sledding also applies at these because generally at ski resorts, the sledding is just as good. So, looking at number five, we have the Snowbird. Uh, they are well, well known uh, for deep powder and great terrain at a resort where it, it's all about the slopes. Uh, as I said, it's epic terrain. And yeah, so it sounds like a pretty good place. Uh, our fourth place is uh, Aspen Mountain. And you've seen this place because of you know the Sochi uh, Olympics and everything. You look at the so uh, Sochi Olympics, so Sochi Games. The Olympics have been there. Um, a lot of these places are referenced in movies, you hear success stories from this place, and they are a world, ca uh, world class ski, uh, hey, I cannot speak today, world class ski town. And you've seen uh, the, in the movies and everything how the entire town skis, snowboards, and everything, it's all surrounded a bit by this. And that's not in the, mo it's in the movies, but it's not just created from Hollywood. That's actually what the town is like. So it's kind of interesting if you're really into skiing or snowboarding to spend a week here because most of these people are living for this and it's in, they live in the perfect spot for it. And they, they, so Aspen is uh, well known for uh, four distinct areas all close together and accessible on only one ticket purchase. They are all clustered around the iconic ski town. So they are kind of surrounding it. So these mountains that are surrounding this town are where all these destinations and distinct areas are that you can snowboard, ski, and do everything. So coming in at third place, we have Vail. It is the largest ski area in Colorado. There are plenty to do off the slopes, good, uh, recreation time, good lodging, uh, good. there's a mall there, a lot of good stuff that you can do, uh, even if it's an amazing snowboarding place and skiing place, but uh, there's a lot to do once you get home also. So they are known uh, as a destination resort that every other destination resort tries to be, um, and that is also their slogan. And coming in at number two, we have Telluride. To the Telluride or Tellerude, um, they are uh, they have a high quality champagne powder, and this is the powder that they use at the Olympics. They want to make it, uh, it's a nice fluffy stuff, and it's the good stuff for snowboarding, skiing. On uh, they do have different uh, levels and uh, types of it, so depending on what you want to ski, snow, uh, or sled on, you uh, can. So it's really uh, accompanying accompanying to every single person that goes there and so it's a uh, accommodating and uh it's it's wonderful uh they have a huge variety of epic terrain and they are known for stunning scenery uh with amazing skiing in the heart of the wild west so our number one first place is Jackson Hole. They are known for their legendary steeps, amazing service, amazing rentals, and uh, they their deep snow. They have a very efficient lift network, and it's a charming town. It's kind of like Aspen, and the people there love skiing and snowboarding and everything. So they're really the hospitality is a ten out of ten, and it's a really positive place to be. It's fun. It's a good time for a getaway if you're looking for a weekend, a week. Get a break. It's a good place to go, and so all those information, all that information, and the rankings are from a snowpack.com. A uh, link will be in the description whenever it's posted, um, and it'll also be on my Twitter or Instagram, one or the other, um, with a links post uh, that I will be posting coming up soon, with all the uh, links that I have used in the past podcasts, um, and that will just be a spreadsheet you can open up and just click on them, and it'll take you there for more information. So really, concluding this episode, looking back over it, um, we'll go back to the climate change. It, it's getting warmer. Uh, the U.S. is now seeing change as we never have before. Breaking records from 1919 all the way back to 1880. Um, and Europe is breaking records almost every single day. Looking at precipitation, everyone's breaking a record. Whether it's good or bad, I mean, if you need more rain, you're getting all that rain. You need more snow which counts for rain, you're getting that snow. Um, if you need 
So in dryness, you might not actually be getting that because most of these places that need a drought don't have a drought. Oddly, you think that they would, but they don't. And so all the places that need this uh, water, this fertile soil and everything, just getting scorched. And so we're really seeing now the effects of CO2. And they talk about, you know, the whole save plastic, save the ocean and everything, cleaning up Earth. When you're looking at it, uh, I read a statistic that said that 20% is plastic as we call, you know, we consider straws, cups, anything along that line of plastic. Um, that's only 20% of the problem of litter in the ocean and garbage and everything. The other 80% is due to fishing equipment. So that is like buckets, that type of thing. So really, we shouldn't be too worried about those metal straws that everyone's trying to get you to buy from online. The straws are honestly fine right now. There will be a time if we don't start saving the earth a little bit better and trying our best that we will need to start using those straws because that will only be our option. Um, but for now, it's really if you see something on the beach, pick it up. One little thing helps. Um, you know, it's the fishing equipment stuff, and that's a whole other problem. That's something that politicians need to get into. And it's something that we as people can't always work on. I mean, we can't help aid, you know, if there's something in the ocean, picking it up and getting it out, recycling it if it's recyclable. Um, and that's another great point. Recycle. I mean, it's you've seen the stuff. Create benches, buildings and stuff. Shoes that are recycled stuff. And it's really cool to see. I mean, they have some plastic shoes. Not made. They're not... Uh, plastic e they're made out of this recycled plastic but they made them into a fabric type and it's they I hear they're really comfortable and so yeah just find that there is probably I guarantee there's probably a uh, recycling plant somewhere right around where you live if not there is a probably recycling bin that they'll come pick up either at schools or uh, somewhere else that you can use so there is places that you can go just take a little bit more effort to sort it out and separate it but think about it at the end of the day you're really helping the environment and it, one person at a time we really can change the world and that's what all this kind of comes down to i mean you can have some fun with the ski resorts and that type of thing but if you aren't careful about what what you're doing and that's not pointed directly at you that's for everyone if we aren't really careful about what we're doing now we're at the point that what happens could be irreversible the latest prediction uh, of a long-term plan is 12 years out. We will end up uh, having irreversible effects on the Earth. And that's something that, you know, we're looking at generations in the future that won't have this. So it's great that there are ski resorts and there are options that you can enjoy in life. But they might not be here in a few generations. And it's kind of selfish to think that we can just enjoy that now and throw it away for later. So ending on a positive note, um, looks like there's a pretty good amount of snow out there. Make some good snowmen and everything. Have some fun with it. And yeah, so thank you so much for watching and listening today. I uh, hope you all have a great rest of your week and stay tuned for uh, the next podcast that's posted. It will be uh, posted uh, on my Twitter ahead of time on what time approximately it will be posted. And yeah, so hope you all enjoyed and thank you again and stay safe.